Good morning, everybody. Um, it's a quiet first week back here in Washington. My name is Meryl Chertoff. I am the executive director of the Justice and Society program at the Aspen Institute. Uh, and since 2011, the Justice and Society program uh, has had a project called the Inclusive America Project, concerned about the rise of Islamophobia and the growth of religious polarization. We began to study best practices uh, and the relationship of religions uh, in the United States, um, we were concerned about three poles, the interfaith aspect of it, the intrafaith aspect of it, that is the uh, relationship between different branches of religion, and also the divides between people of faith uh, and uh, what some have called the nuns, but uh, a term that I'm starting to use is seekers, uh, which we heard this summer at Aspen. Um, Religious pluralism is in the DNA of the United States. Not only is it embodied in the First Amendment's guarantees of free exercise and non-establishment of any one faith, it's mentioned in the writing of the founders of the Republic, including George Washington and Thomas Jefferson. Quoting from Ibu Patel's new book, In the United States, it's a signature part of our constitutional system that people from different religious communities receive equal treatment under the law and in government policy. We see this in Washington's promise, quoted, all possess alike liberty of conscience and immunities of citizenship, and that from the letter to the Torah congregation. It's enshrined in the Virginia Declaration of Religious Freedom, drafted by Thomas Jefferson, the prescribing any citizen as unworthy of the public confidence by laying upon at the time him, an incapacity of being called to offices of trust and emolument unless he professes or renounces this or that religious opinion is depriving him injuriously of those privileges and advantages to which in common with his fellow citizens he has a right. We know the myriad contributions that religious communities make as the source of a significant amount of social capital and the force behind many civic institutions. Look at the wonderful schools and hospitals and relief efforts that are being conducted both in the US and around the world by faith-based organizations. Today, we face the reality of increasing religious diversity and the decline of what Robbie Jones called majority white Christian America. Although if you look at the demographics, of course, the numbers still show that our religious minorities are quite small in number. For almost a decade, the Inclusive America Project has examined this issue. And this year, we released a report entitled Pluralism in Peril, which has specific recommendations for civil society at the community and state level. The book in includes contributions by Ibu Patel, by John Anazu, and by our panelist, Shirley Hoekstra's colleague, Shapri DiMaglio. Recommendations are specifically targeted on strategies for allyship, resilience, and education for youth around religious diversity in schools, youth service organizations, and other places where young people congregate. This summer in Aspen, we gathered a group of curriculum providers, youth service organizations, and funders to see if we could facilitate partnerships to do important bridging work in local communities. I'm so pleased to welcome Ibu, Earl, Earl and Shirley to the Aspen Institute today. Uh, the vision laid out in Ibu's book is ambitious and instructive, and it's a conversation we all need to be a part of. How do we achieve pluralism? I agree with Ibu, we should focus on law and policy, civil society, and civil religion. Uh, my last point before I turn it over to Zenot is that this is all a generational project. And that means we're going to be working in these fields for many years, and we do need commensurate funding. We need funders to invest beyond rapid response efforts and begin to look at how they can join the field building efforts on this issue. <coughs> I'm so pleased to turn it over now to my good colleague and Inclusive America Project Director, Zenat Rahman, and also to particularly thank Ibu Patel, who's been with us on this journey from the beginning. Thank you so much. Thank you, Meryl. Um, 
There's Mike in here. Mike's not in here, so we'll say thank you to Mike later. Um, one of our colleagues, it's his last day of work today, and so we feel we're having a lot of emotions. So thank you all of you for being here on what feels like the first week back at school. Um, I think it's just apropos that I'm here with three uh, wonderful panelists who uh, sit in higher education. Before we begin, I'd just like to let you know that we're live streaming. So hello, everybody online watching us. Um, and C-SPAN is taping, and this will be aired later tonight on C-SPAN. Um, so feel free to use social media. This is all um, open to the public. And, um, and let's get started. I'd like to start by introducing my colleagues, um, my co-panelists. Uh, first to my left is Shirley Hoogstra, who's the seventh president of the Council for Christian Colleges and Universities. Um, prior to being the head of CCCU, Hoogstra served for 15 years as vice president for student life at her alma mater, Calvin College. She also spent a decade before that practicing law, uniquely, I think, the only lawyer on this panel, which is, which is unique for DC. Um, <laughs> she served on the boards of several community organizations, such as the New Haven County Bar Association and Calvin College. Um, and her full bio is in the packet that you all have. Uh, to her left is Ibu Patel, who's the founder of the Interfaith Youth Corps. And for over 15 years, almost two decades, I think it's been more than two, two decades, Ibu has worked with government, social sector organizations, and college and university campuses to help make interfaith cooperation a social norm. Um, Ibu served on President Obama's inaugural Faith Council, and he's written several books, Acts of Faith, Sacred Ground, and Interfaith Leadership, A Primer, and of course, the book we're here for today, Out of Many Faiths, um, Religious Diversity and the American Promise. Um, thank you, Ibu. And to his left is Earl Lewis, who is a social historian and director of the University of Michigan Center for Social Solutions. He's president emeritus of the Andrew Mellon Foundation. And his work examined and address, addresses critical questions for our society, including the role of race in American history, diversity, equity and inclusion, graduate education, humanities scholarship, and universities and their larger communities. Small, small <laughs> work, yeah. Always. <laughs> so any day kind of in DC, um, at Aspen, in DC, actually in this country, we're talking about bridging social divides. We talk about how we are divided as a country across uh, many different lines and how do we, what does it mean to be American and how do we create bridges across divides? Um, what we are going to focus on today is why religion? Why is it so important to bridge those divides um, across religion? And Ibu mentions in the book that the Founding Fathers got this right. Um, but you also begin with positing, if American democracy depends on the vibrancy of our civic life, and our civic life depends on at least in part of the contributions of religious communities, then it would seem self-evident that facilitating such participation is a compelling interest for American democracy. Um, I think that's something all of us in the room can agree in, but I think that it's not a given. And I think what this book um, says is we might not get there. You know, that this, um, we are in an American, in an America with increased, uh, with, where our diversity is increasing, where what has maybe held together the religious uh, freedom part of this has been a shared um, majority, which is diminishing in numbers. Um, and increasingly, we have young people who are not attached to any religious affiliation or institution. And so um, how do we bridge those divides and how do we kind of work past that? I think um, Earl states this in his foreword, which is, this is I think the question that I'd, I'd want to dis I want to discuss and I think that really drives the day. What does an expanded, inclusive, but not homogenized civil religious narrative look like in 21st century America? Mm -hmm. How do we expand the narrative of who's American as our diversity becomes more pronounced? And what is the roadmap to achieve these goals? Um, the book, of course, delves into different points of, of view on this. Uh, Meryl outlined a little bit that the Inclusive America Project um, looks at how we create a network and a series around planning, dialogue, and action. So I think uh, today we'll talk both about the theoretical framework, but also the examples from uh, my three panelists of practical application. You know, what, what do communities, colleges, higher education, policymakers, what can we do? Um, so with that, I'd like to begin with the first question. Um, as I stated, American pluralism is at a crossroads. And it's a place where Ibu describes in the book where, quote, we discover that our civil religion narrative no longer connects our past with our present and with our hoped for future in a satisfactory way. The book confronts our changing demographic landscape, particularly with respect to religion, and it explores a framework that can guide us to be an inclusive nation 
where the contributions of different religions become part of the broader American story. Can each of you begin by commenting why you feel addressing religious diversity is so important in this current moment in time? And I'll start with you, Shirley. Yeah, thank you. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here and to be here um, with the other panelists because of the important work that you have already hi highlighted. So why religion? So religion has been part of the foundational civil society glue in the United States. Um, and people hold deeply held beliefs that really um, animate their lives in important ways. So uh, it's the kind of thing that gives you joy, it gives you hope, um, is a place where if you're uh, confronting death or sadness, there seems to be some answer. So it's this really important fabric. And then as we become more diverse, um, and as we perhaps can't just be in pockets, we now have to confront, well, what are those sincerely held beliefs? What do they look like in other faiths? And by actually asking um, questions like that, how can my faith tradition help me understand my neighbor's faith tradition? It's going to help us actually live well together with difference. And it's, uh, we are hearing a lot about difference, but what we want to think about is how to live well in the midst of difference. And I, I appreciate the work that Eva's doing on that. Thank you. Eva. So I, I think that there's several things here. Uh, first of all, thank you to you, Zina, to Merrill, to the Aspen Institute for, for launching this book. Uh, thank you to, to Earl, the series co-editor, for inviting me to be a part of it. Um, religious diversity is a part of America's founding ideal. We could literally look at what George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, James Madison said about religious diversity in the late 18th century, and we would look at those, uh, we would look at those things and cherish them today, right? Mm -hmm. So Washington's statement that uh, this government will give to bigotry no sanction and persecution no assistance, that we all have a like liberty of conscience. Uh, Benjamin Franklin uh, making a donation to the building fund of every religious community in Philadelphia, asking them to all uh, celebrate July 4th together to mourn him together when he died. This notion of welcoming religious diversity, nurturing interfaith cooperation is literally part of America's founding ideal. I think that's also at the center of America's genius. Because in a diverse democracy, the way you build up that society is you give diverse identity communities their dignity. And with that dignity, those diverse identity communities will contribute to the broader society. I think that there is no place where that happens better than in American higher education. So you have all of these wonderful institutions founded by religious communities. One thinks of Georgetown here uh, in, mm -hmm. in, uh, in DC. My dad went to Notre Dame, mm -hmm. for example. 230 Catholic colleges and universities, uh, dozens and dozens of Methodist, Presbyterian, ELCA um, uh, uh, colleges and universities. All of these emerge with a purpose of nurturing people in their own tradition, but also serving the broader public. I think to myself, you know, if the anti-Catholic forces had won a hundred years ago, the people who said that places like Georgetown and Notre Dame were Trojan horses for popery, so to speak, if they had won, our civil society mm -hmm. would be much less rich. Right now, we face a set of anti-Muslim forces that that are saying the exact same things about the kind of Muslim institutions that are inspired by the Islamic tradition and seek to serve the common good. I think America is much poorer without those institutions, and it's not just a violation of Muslims, it's a violation of American ideals. And I think that that idea is at the center of this book. Thank you. Oh. Yes, good morning, everyone. So this project, in a way, and Ibu referred to it. So five and a half years ago, we had a conversation when I was just starting as, as president of the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation about the growing diversity in America and how we under, should understand it, what we needed to do to better understand that diversity. Diversity in a lot of ways is about the demographic transitions that we can point to and demographers have begun to outline. And in the first volume of this series, Our Compelling Interest, uh, we actually end up saying that for us to actually see diversity as key to a prosperous democracy, yeah. then we needed to un first be able to define diversity. We needed to figure out then how to leverage it uh, in a multiplicity of settings. And then we need to always value diversity. And as we thought about how we actually put this into action, then uh, religion became a key piece mm -hmm. as we think through the ways in which we define ourselves in relationship to others. 
uh, and, and I'm one of the folks who writes about identity uh, as multi-positional. We're not one thing at any time. We actually have a whole sphere of elements of ourselves that are always there, and, and they're always defined in relational terms and in contextual terms. And religion is something that sometimes can be seen and understood, other times assumed and not observed. Uh, and in a conversational way, as we work through the democratic project that is America, we needed to come back and investigate not only religion writ large, but the ways in which we value then the differences among us as a way to leverage then the best aspects of this project called the American mm -hmm. experience. And for us, then the volume that Ibu uh, has uh, crafted and the others have added to is a way to open a question. It takes us back to a beginning, uh, which is to say that in the formulation and the creation of the US, we had notions about America. And now we fast forward to a contemporary era and where time is compressed, speed is of essence, a generation is 18 months yeah. rather than 25 years. Mm -hmm. And we cycle information so quickly that we don't have the opportunity to reflect and ask the question, so what is religion? Mm -hmm. What does it mean to be Muslim in America? Is this a new creation? Mm -hmm. No. I mean, uh, as Ibu outlines, I mean, at least 25% has been estimated of the African peoples who were imported. Uh, were of Islamic heritage and tradition. And that piece gets written over and has been, I'm an American historian, uh, my colleagues have sort of covered that up as we actually address yeah. other pieces. And so for us to open this question is to actually uh, invite us to think anew about what it has been to be American, what it means to be um, an America, and what in many ways to tell the American story. Very good. Um, I think each of you have kind of mentioned, you know, in your opening remarks about the contribution of religion to civil society mm -hmm. and that religious religion and religious communities are a source of a significant amount of social capital. Again, that's how it's been, right? And so um, you write about, Ibu, how civic life is enhanced by religious participation and tolerance for religious diversity. But you also quote Robert, Robert Putnam who says, as diversity increases, the qualities that typically characterize a strong community decrease. The higher the diversity, the more people distrust their neighbors, the less they volunteer and give to charity. We know from Robbie Jones polling, who's a respondent in the book, that an increasing amount of Americans are unaffiliated with any religious institutions at all. So first to you, Ibu, and then Earl and Shirley, mm -hmm. how can religious communities con continue to contribute to civic life in a meaningful way when as Americans, our religious institutions and our affiliation to them are changing? They're not organized in the same way that they once were. Right. So, Religion in America is always changing, right? And so the language that we use for this at Interfaith Youth Corps is actually, uh, we don't use the term religious diversity except as a shorthand. We use the, the, the kind of geekier academic formulation, diverse orientations around religion. So Sunnis and Shias are part of the diverse orientations around religion, specifically the tradition of Islam. Seekers, uh, um, agnostics, atheists are, are examples of diverse orientations around religion. So our big question is, how do you have a healthy, a healthy society when all of these diverse orientations around religion are in interaction and they're changing all the time themselves? One of the ways I think that that happens is, first of all, we continue to, we continue to hold up this founding ideal, right? And I, one of the remarkable things about the United States and religious identity and diversity is you can literally say that the founders set the North Star, they set the ideal, and that the nation over time seeks to live up to that. You frankly cannot say that about any other identity. Mm -hmm. The founders did not set the ideal when it comes to race. They did not set the ideal when it comes to gender. They did set the ideal when it comes to religious identity and diversity, and there's this kind of continual living up to it. I think one of the ways that that happens best is when we allow diverse orientations around religion to express themselves in a variety of ways, including ways that serve the common good, right? So uh, a Methodist hospital is an expression of Methodist faith and the Methodist tradition. It's also a place where thousands and thousands of people who are not Methodists get treated and healed. So one of the ways we allow Methodists or Presbyterians or Jews or Catholics or Muslims to, to be Methodist, Presbyterian, Jewish, Catholic, Muslim, et cetera, is to build this set of institutions inspired by their identity 
which serves other people. Now, I think that that becomes increasingly complex in a society where there are, are no longer maybe five or six dominant expressions of religion or orientations around religion. There are now five or 6,000 or 50 or 60,000. I think that one of the things we do well in America is we continually rewrite and revise our national story. We continually reshape our civil society. It's one of the reasons we love working with young people at Interfaith Youth Corps is because those are, the, those are new storytellers. Those are new hands, yeah. right, who are continuing to, to, to extend that story and con continuing to shape that society. I'd love to give you some uh, examples of yes. this, uh, how religion is shaping civil society. So uh, take Houston with the hurricane. Um, one of the stories that is not told as frequently but is very true is that it was actually the faith community, all the churches, all the volunteers from all over the United States sort of descended on Houston. And they said, we're going to immediately get involved. Um, and so people's lives were made so much better immediately because you had all these volunteers who were not involved with the flood. Here's another example. Um, the tragedy that ha was, was happening around the United States around young black men being shot by police officers. And then we saw what happened in Dallas where there were a police officer shot by a sniper. What immediately happened within two days of that, the mayor of Dallas called upon an African-American pastor and a white pastor who had been meeting together, I would say providentially, for the, for the whole year before to say, what if Ferguson came to Dallas? What would we do? And it did and they were ready. And actually, what's not told very often, but the churches uh, across the city organized to say what we're going to do immediately is gather together as diverse people around the common good, around faith, to see how we are going to work with the, uh, the sorrow we're feeling about this whole thing. Lastly, uh, Grand Rapids, Michigan. Uh, St. Mary's, to your point, is a wonderful, hospital in Grand Rapids. They have other big, wonderful hostile systems, but it's at St. Mary's that are specifically organized and by mission funded for the homeless. In every single city, we have a huge homeless population. Who takes care of them in the emergency room? It is the Catholic hospitals who are actually seeing that as their mission. It's unsung. Right? It's unsung, but it is so important to the fabric, our own well-being. It's almost invisible, but essential. So I'll ask you to respond, and also, how do you, then how do you make that explicit? Because I think those of mm. us in the field, it's really difficult to sometimes articulate the value of religion in the public square. And I think part of it is, is that when you start looking at the numbers and ask the question, who's attending church, you yeah. end up talking about individuals. Mm -hmm. But what uh, Shirley and Ebu both refer to is actually institutions, mm -hmm. and yeah. that in some ways in communities across this nation and elsewhere, institutions still remain viable vehicles for effective community yes. change. And so you began to see it in an example, you can, you can talk about the churches, but let's start with universities and colleges, mm -hmm. right? And so my, I was at one point in my life the provost at Emory University in Atlanta, and my colleague Jim Wagner, who was the president, used to always stand up in front of a group of students and he said, uh, you can't be lazy in anything, and that includes being a lazy atheist. Uh, and that is, uh, we at Emory will force you to ask questions about it, all of your beliefs and your assumptions. So pause and think about that. Here's an institution that was founded in the Methodist tradition and that was uh, no longer Methodist in terms of its student body, but was inviting students in from all religious perspectives and asking them a question. Why do you believe? That's right. And what do you believe? And how do you act on what you know and understand? How do you do that both inside of this community and outside? So there were community projects that followed from the activation of those questions. Here's a case where the institution played a role. I mean, I can talk about the hospitals too because Emory owned seven, eight hospitals in Atlanta <laughs> and by the time I left in 2012 and was a major provider. But it was also something else which is not often talked about. It was also a major employer. It was the third largest employer in metropolitan Atlanta. And so in that way, the questions about religion that were uh, central to its founding found itself being reintroduced in ceremonies and rituals on campus all the time. And so for the individuals who worked on campus to see uh, students from the Muslim faith, from the Jewish faith, uh, Catholics and Christians actually engaging in certain worship ceremonies was a way to educate not only the students there, but also the 30,000 faculty and staff 
who worked on campus. And that was another way of actually doing this. And so practical ways and where institutions connect the individuals uh, to begin to both challenge basic assumptions but also advance uh, certain principles. As Earl's talking, I can actually see, and it's kickoff week for many of the colleges and universities right, um, in the United States, this idea of visually being together. This is very important. Um, and uh, Emory and uh, the almost 200 uh, campuses in, in my organization, the service learning hours, the amount of service that students are doing in their communities, tutoring, um, working in other nonprofits, being available for this civic structure in the city, uh, you couldn't replicate, actually, all of the ways that students are performing this kind of common good in the cities in which they live. And, and, and uh, what your work is doing is actually promoting exactly that kind of noble heart, higher education at its best, liberal arts education at its best with professional programs. It's creating a noble life. And a noble life is a life that includes service and belief, uh, something that you're not just working for yourself, but for others. So, you're, um, so what you guys are kind of talking about is, or Earl mentioned especially, is the, this role of institutions being really important and not just individuals. Um, and in our work in Inclusive America Project, we look a lot at young people, kind of K through 12. Um, and as we talked about what the founders' ideals are, and this idea of articulating the contribution of faith communities, what is the connection uh, you, you see between this civic education, which is declining and decreasing you know, amongst young people, and religious pluralism, and service learning? Um, so I, I want you to kind of speak to that um, trifecta, in a sense. And how do you increase those literacy rates uh, together? So it's not just an understanding of a different person's faith, um, but it's actually the broader place that that sits. Um, in our in our history, and you want to be contained. So that. I'd like to take that at, uh, um, uh, in two dimensions. One is the civil society dimension, and maybe mm -hmm. a click up from service learning. It's it's the ways in which uh, the the kind of civic contributions are essential to our social well being. And I want to take Houston mm -hmm. for a moment. So mm -hmm. Houston, after Harvey, my my wife's got sisters who live in Houston, and one of them commented to me that there's been more interfaith cooperation in exactly. Houston in the three months after Harvey than there were in the previous 30 years, mm -hmm. right? And it's, it's interesting to consider if you work for the Red Cross and you're in Houston and a hurricane hits, if you don't have the interfaith leadership and literacy skills to organize uh, gurdwaras, temples, synagogues, mosques, Catholic and evangelical churches, et cetera, with federal government and state and local, government, you just can't do your job well, right? So when uh, a university, a CIC college, uh, uh, a CCCU college, uh, a, a Catholic college or university, when it uh, facilitates interfaith service projects mm -hmm. for 19-year-olds, it is in part a noble life. Mm -hmm. It is in part uh, uh, what that college or university ought to be doing. It's also in part uh, preparation for, for civic leadership and for professional competence, right? Can you imagine being a healthcare provider in a hospital system where like literally on, on any given 10 or 12 hour shift, you are encountering uh, a dozen different yes. orientations around religion with, with life or death consequences. Yes. Different religious interpretations literally yes. have different definitions of death. Yeah. If you are a, a healthcare provider and you don't know that, you just can't do your job well. You'll be offensive. You'll be yeah. offensive, right? So, so the way that we, it is, it is remarkable actually that in a nation that is the world's first religiously diverse democracy in which religious freedom, religious and religious diversity are part of the founding ideal, that we lack that kind of interfaith literacy and leadership, that we haven't woven it in to our education mm -hmm. and, and, and higher ed systems especially, I, I, is, uh, needs to be fixed. Let us say, I like to be an optimist, let's just say it needs to be fixed. And the oh, second thing that I want to just highlight is just because the founder set a North Star ideal when it comes to religious freedom and, and welcoming religious diversity and speaking of interfaith cooperation doesn't mean that ideal falls from heaven into, uh, into Idaho, right? Or into <laughs> Nebraska or Illinois or New York, right? The, a, a signature part of the American project is that uh, 
people, citizens, work to make things happen here. And I think one of the great stories about this, which was part of my research for, for this book, uh, one of the great stories is, is, is the term Judeo-Christian nation. One of the things I like to joke about when I go to college campuses is, you know, when the pilgrims arrived and they dusted off Plymouth Rock, they saw etched in Plymouth Rock the term Judeo-Christian nation. Mm. And I have a bunch of bright 19-year-olds going like, wow. And I'm like, <laughs> that's a joke, actually, <laughs> right? So where does the term come from? Right. Where does the term come from, right? The fact is, it's a made-up term. Judeo-Christian is not a theological term. The way that Christians view Jesus is as Lord and Savior, the way that Jews view Jesus is a good rabbi maybe, right? Let's discuss. It's not a particularly historically accurate term because it's not like Jews fared well in Christian lands for, for, for centuries. So where does it come from? It is a response by civic leaders in the 1930s to the anti-Catholic, anti-Semitic, and anti-Black KKK efforts of the 1920s. A group of people in 1928 forms an organization called the NCCJ, the National Conference on Christians and Jews, where they say, we can't have uh, a KKK nation that's, ex that's excluding the contributions of Catholics and Jews, and that is in uh, that is discriminating so, so violently against them. And they not only create a whole set of civic efforts, like tri-faith dialogues across the country, they also invent a term called Judeo-Christian nation that has become so uh, part of the national DNA that we forget that it was invented. So clearly, part of what I'm doing in this book is saying at a time of really ugly Islamophobia, does it actually, in my kind of American optimism, present us with an opportunity? Does the response to that Islamophobia, the, the, the recentering of American ideals, uh, the flexing of the muscles of, of uh, civic nation and healthy religiously diverse democracy, does that in fact define America for the next 50 or 100 years? And that's my hope. Oh, can I ask you a follow-up question to that? Sure. Um, which is that, you know, Maybe just looking around the room, many of us in this room, or some of us in the room at least, don't fit, wouldn't fit under the Judeo-Christian framework, um, and that you know, religious pluralism in America uh, reveals that the acceptance of religious diversity has always been tangled with perceptions of race. Mm -hmm. And in the past, the American solution has been to kind of stretch this idea of whiteness and broaden the definition of whiteness. I think the Judeo-Christian framework is a good example of that, uh, rather rather than to deal with the problem of racism um, head on. I'd like you to speak to the connections you see between the fields of the work of religious pluralism and racial equity, and then, and then how do we address race and racism as a part of the conversation on religious pluralism? The latter part of that question could take us another two years, but let me, let me start I think with more than, more than Yeah, that. Let, let me start. I mean, as Ibu was talking, I was thinking back. I was born in the segregated South in 1955, went to segregated schools until I was in the 10th grade. Uh, so I'm part of what I refer to as a transitional generation. Uh, the first group of kids who are actually in mass desegregated schools. I left Virginia and went, uh, coastal Virginia, and went to western Minnesota in 1974. Uh, and so where Fargo, North Dakota was the closest big city. Uh, and, uh, and I'm now the chairman of the board of this small liberal arts college, uh, uh, Concordia College in Moorhead, Minnesota. And so I can remember going back, and this is how race and religion began to connect. I was a raised Christian, uh, grew up in a Presbyterian household, and found myself at a Lutheran church school. Uh, and I didn't know anything about Lutherans. I really didn't. In fact, I remember coming home after the first semester and going through the yellow pages to see if there were any Lutheran churches in Norfolk, because I had never seen one. Uh, and, and I realized in some ways I had driven by one uh, for all my life, but had never noticed it because it was outside the orbit uh, of my world. And it, was, it says something about the nature of American life, right? Uh, America today is actually, ironically, more segregated today uh, than it was uh, in the 1970s by almost all sociological uh, measures. Mm -hmm. And so we find ourselves then coming back to colleges and universities uh, and the military doing something that we don't do anywhere else, is how do we introduce people to one another? And so we end up with two institutions that socialize the majority of 18-year-olds, the military or, or colleges and universities. It's the first time they meet someone who's different who didn't live in their zip code, 
uh, who didn't have their range of experiences. And so if you sort of think about that, the race problem is embedded in the ways in which we actually have constructed lived communities. Uh, and the religion problem is embedded in the ways we've constructed lived communities. Because if we begin to map zip codes all across the United States and see where people live and with whom they interact in the majority fashion, you find they don't get to know one another. So we create new spaces and places for them to have those encounters. And sometimes they do so um, in ways that, uh, that garner attention on Monday morning. Uh, because they have conflict as they're expressing themselves in different ways, and other times they actually learn to live and experience one another in new ways. Race is the American story, right? I mean, we have to create it. And, um, I remind, I'm also happen to be this year the president of the Organization of American Historians, and as I remind my colleagues, 400 years ago in 2019, so we're approaching the 400th anniversary, uh, the first 19 folks of African descent were imported uh, into uh, colonial Jamestown. Mm. Uh, with that moment, we introduced the political economy of slavery. Mm. The political economy of slavery uh, endured for 60% of what we think of as the history of the United States. It was the ways in which we actually organized ourselves. It was the ways in which people garnered wealth. It was the ways in which we created a, a different civic myth about the nation, about who was in and who was out. And in some ways, as we come back to dealing with the stories and the new myths about how we begin to include, we're forced to interrogate those old myths uh, as well. And I think as we talk about um, pluralism and religion, we find ourselves having to ask the question, why do some stories actually exist and, and, and coexist in ways. And I'll, I'll end with, with one, and Ibu's heard this before. Um, I end with an encounter. So in July of uh, 2016, my brother and I were sitting at our house in Virginia Beach, and one of our neighbors went by. And it was the 4th of July, and they had an American flag flying up high. But they had a Confederate flag flying below. And so you had the juxtaposition on the 4th of July of two versions of an American story. Mm -hmm. They're in symbolic form. And my brother, who's an engineer, leaned over to me and says, you think they get the irony? Mm -hmm. And I said, no. Mm -hmm. Let's wave. <laughs> so we waved at our neighbors. And they waved back. Because in some ways, the boundaries of community said that a gesture of kindness should be returned with a gesture of kindness. Mm. But in there was another story. It's a story about who gets to claim what version of America and is one subsumed by the other. And is that part that's actually at the heart of even as we talk about our religious diversity as well? Yes, absolutely. Whose version of America gets to be claimed and is one subsumed by the other? Right. And Ibu, you spend so much of the book beautifully demonstrating the Muslim community, the Muslim <coughs> Ummah, as we call it, um, and examples you know, derived from friends of ours and people we've seen do work. Um, but you also kind of talk about the, both the racism directed towards the Muslim community, but maybe also within the Muslim community. Um, and you, and you, you know, obviously talk about Cordoba House and, and have different examples. Can you speak a little bit um, to the evolution of the Muslim community right. as you've been a part of it, but also um, how do you extrapolate kind of what's happening right now with the Muslim American community as a broader case study or an example for America and what's instructive within that? Because I think there's some interesting trends that you kind of try to you know, tease out um, in the book. Right, so uh, one of the chapters in the book is called uh, the, uh, the American Ummah and the Era of Islamophobia. Mm -hmm. And part of what I'm trying to do in this chapter is, is uh, get a sense of, you know, I, I, I believe partially because it's accurate and partially because I'm an optimist, that people's response to ugliness becomes the defining character of the next generation. It's not the ugliness itself, it's the response to that ugliness, right? And so how are Muslims responding to, uh, to Islamophobia? How is American Islamophobia reshaping American Islam, particularly in ways that I consider somewhat positive? So one way is that for uh, the first generation of, of when, when, when immigrant Muslims came, largely after 1965, right, uh, Muslims from South Asia like us, Muslims from the Middle East, uh, Muslims from Persia, Muslims from 
uh, um, uh, from other parts of the world, from, from the Pacific, uh, they built separate internally facing Muslim institutions. Literally, there's a Bosnian mosque, there's a Syrian mosque, there's an Indonesian mosque, there's a Pakistani mosque, et cetera, et cetera, right? And they principally understand Muslim identity as things that are done in private orient, orienting around piety, right? Uh, and they pay literally no attention to the African-American Muslim experience. In fact, in some ways, they define themselves in contrast to it. Mm -hmm. So what happens after 9-11 and mm -hmm. in the era of Islamophobia? Mm -hmm. You realize that uh, you need each other and that you're not just an Indonesian Muslim or a Pakistani Muslim or a Syrian Muslim or a Saudi Muslim or an Indian Muslim. You are an American Muslim and that you didn't just arrive in 1967 after the Immigration and, and Naturalization Act, that, that there have been Arabic prayers in this country mm -hmm. probably from the time that those first slave ar slaves arrived. And so the whole narrative reshapes. And you start to say, we've been here for 400 years. And honestly, the most generous people in this whole story are black Muslims who are like, you ignored us for the 60 years that you've been here and now you want to say you are the latest chapter in our story. I guess we've been generous for a few centuries and I will be generous to you too, yeah. right? So the story of Muslims in America isn't just an immigrant story that's 60 years old. It's an American story that's 400 years old. It includes Muhammad Ali. It includes Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. It includes uh, most deaf. It includes all of these major figures, largely from the African American community and tradition, and it is not ethnically split anymore. Right? I think a final thing here is um, it does not only principally orient around piety. Uh, it also orients around contribution. Right? So uh, it used to be that. Uh, the first question that was asked when somebody claimed a Muslim identity was, uh, do, you, do you pray five times a day? Mm -hmm. At least in somebody's mind, mm -hmm. right? It, there are now multiple categories for how to express one's Muslim identity, including, are you a civil rights lawyer helping uh, mosques uh, uh, establish themselves? So I'll just end with a quick story. You know, my wife, who uh, is a progressive Muslim, um, whose principal expression of Islam is not piety, although she's still devout, right? Um, she's a civil rights attorney inspired by her Muslim faith. And uh, she was asked by uh, a very conservative mosque foundation that, that did not get zoning in a Chicago suburb mm. because of, of religious discrimination. She was asked by a conservative mosque foundation to defend them in court. Right? So here is a mosque that my wife would not pray at because the space for women's prayer is so small and probably would not want her to pray at because her expression of being a Muslim woman is not something that, that they want their 11-year-old girls to see. She is defending this mosque in court and its exactly. ability to exist and wearing her skirt suit in court amongst a, a set of Muslim male leaders who will not shake her hand. That's American Islam. Mm -hmm. right? That cooperation, we disagree on some things, and we recognize that, that we need to work together on a whole set of other things within an American framework. That's American Islam. Shirley, I'd like you to reflect on that, but also kind of speak to you administer, look over this distinctive network. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, college populations have moved from being kind of homogeneously maybe white and Protestant to hyper-religiously diverse. Um, how do the colleges in the CCCU network balance their strong Christian identity with religious diversity, a respect for religious pluralism, you know, and their fellow peer, student yeah. peers like who, who, who describes and Earl describe? Yeah. Uh, first of all, I'm so grateful uh, for having a teacher and friend and mentor like Ibu because he is helping us understand a part of American society that if you're a Protestant Christian, you might not have as much information. Um, and the idea that we love God and love our neighbor, right? This is a central tenet 
uh, to deeply held faith beliefs. And if you don't know your neighbor, you can't actually love people very well if you don't know them very well. I don't think it's by accident that uh, God in his sovereignty is asking us to be in closer proximity to the things that are most different because he really wants us to love him and love our neighbor well, and it gives us this opportunity. And so on college campuses, the ones that I represent and the uh, private institutions that are, and other faith-based institutions that are represented across the American landscape. You see, when you know what you believe, you actually are not as afraid of picking up and examining something that may have some similarities, but it's different. And so um, we've done uh, some uh, NESI, it's a, it's a national survey, and they found that faith-based colleges and the ones that we've looked at um, are ours, actually have more diversity conversations in a classroom than not. Uh, some people think that it's sort of a brainwashing, but it's really not. It's the idea that you know what you believe, and John Inezzo says this in Confident Pluralism, you know what you believe, and therefore you can confidently understand what other people believe. Now, um, also what we are finding on the American education landscape is uh, Muslim families, devout Muslim families, um, are actually uh, looking to faith-based colleges because what they find for their student is that they understand that this would be taken seriously for them. Um, and in fact, uh, Baylor University has a high degree of Muslim students uh, in their institution because they are willing to take seriously this love of the text this love of God, and so their student actually has an easier experience, even though it's not the predominant faith history. Do either of you want to comment on that, Earl? No, I'll, 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 I'll wait. There are <laughs> things to say. I'm still I'm, I'm thinking about kind of this thing that I'll put out there, which is you know whose stories get told, mm -hmm. and how does that become part of the uh, larger narrative, and. You know, uh, when you're in this field, I think we talk a lot about terms and definitions and what terms do we use and what does religious pluralism even mean? Is interfaith sexy or interesting enough to, you know, get lay people um, on board or engaged with it? And, um, and so kind of when we talk about this new national narrative and um, is it Laurie Patton, you know, who talks a lot about like our myths, our big myths and the big stories that we want to see ourselves as a part of, I actually think that's really important and I think you know some of the Muslims that you mentioned in the book um, are, are are important because they are they are also first generation you know traversing a path where they're the first people in policy but they have they, they become an archetype that people can look to Ibu Patel is an interfaith leader Keith Ellison as a member of Congress so on and so forth how do we do that work of making sure that these kind of di diverse stories and narratives do become part of the national narrative? Um, we, in our clutch before this, talked a little bit about John McCain's funeral. Mm -hmm. How does that bridging happen? You know, and, and, I, and fully understanding Meryl's point earlier, which this is a generational thing. Mm -hmm. This is not going to happen you know, in the next two to five years. How do we begin to start using that aspirational vocabulary language and incorporate those stories once we know what they are? Right. Um, uh, let, me, let me jump in because um, uh, when there is uh, some uh, religious discrimination that um, happens uh, in America, um, if there is Muslim discrimination that happens in America, Christians need the f to be the first to defend Muslims and other faiths. And um, when um, a Muslim leader like Ebel says, you know what, it's important to have religious diversity in higher education, this matters. right? So this pluralism means that you need to have allies who are willing to stand up for uh, popular and unpopular beliefs because they believe in this foundational belief of religious diversity. Go back to colleges and universities. In yeah. some ways, um, we started with the diversity framework and we glided over those institutions and inclusion uh, as the other part. And mm -hmm. so what does it mean then to have an institution that was founded with one faith tradition but that has invited in others? Mm -hmm. And so how do they find their way into those institutions and do so comfortably? And, and, and that's the challenge, I think, that higher education in the U.S. has faced, but it's a sort of a, a metaphor for a lot of institutions uh, across uh, the society. So I, I usually will argue and write that in the 1970s, uh, most colleges and universities uh, decided they were going to diversify, and they did it by the numbers. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can almost think about the little coloring book uh, where you had the numbers, and if you charted them all together, you had a diagram, and you're hoping that picture uh, would tell you something. 
Uh, well, we did that too. Uh, we brought people by the numbers and assumed if we brought them in, then uh, everyone would uh, benefit from being there. But we didn't ask the second question, which was, how should the institution change right. as we bring in different people? Right. What is the obligation of the institution yeah. to change uh, if we're going to bring in a more diverse set of actors who may ask new questions of us? And so if you go back, and certainly at small liberal arts colleges, but also at major universities too, you see this ebb and flow uh, between the 1970s and the 1980s into the 1990s. By the late 2000s and early uh, teens uh, of this century, students begin to ask then a different set of questions of the institutions. It's not just a question about inclusion, but then it's a question about equity too. Uh, and so what does it mean for me to actually have a space and a place that now not only I can call my own, mm -hmm. but I actually feel comfortable in? Right. And can I then, what does it mean for me to check someone else? And how do I negotiate those boundaries between what your rights should be and what my privileges should be uh, inside of these institutions? And, and it's a living matter on, on the ground where religion is that one part of that. I mean, how do then, if you have a tradition, uh, Ibu in his book starts with the story of his father uh, and going to Notre Dame football games. And since I'm a University of Michigan guy, we have a conversation that we have uh, <laughs> later on today about last weekend. Uh, but, uh, but there's this way of, of which then, what does it mean to believe that that team is your team, mm -hmm. as well as it is someone else's team. I mean, how do you claim that institution as your institution? His father had an answer to that question in his time and day. <clears throat> this generation of students have different versions of that question, searching for new answers to how do I claim this place? Right. And will this place claim me? And can I change this place? And does this place want to be changed? And I think that as we talk about religion, particularly on college campuses, the institutions have to stand back and ask, OK, are we willing to be co-partners in an exercise in social change? Otherwise, if we think that um, the number of folks attending registered religious bodies is on a decline, if we can't spark in individuals on campuses in some sense of believing that the institution can change, that number may continue to decline. So, so Earl has yeah. said this exactly right, the, the guest versus host, yeah. right? Yeah. Are you at home? Yeah. You know, are you an owner of that institution? Are you always a guest? Yeah. Um, and we talk about innovation in higher education all the time, and it's, it's absolutely necessary. But the innovation is not going to just be classroom curriculum. In, yeah. uh, it's going to be innovation around these big questions of civic knowledge. Yeah. It's going to be, what, are the, what do we need today around those things? What do we need to know about religion? I would think that our secular institutions, higher education institutions, should not actually push uh, religious conversation away, but actually because the whole world is, is struggling around religious conflict. And who's going to be the best diplomats? Who's going to be the best State Department people? Who's going to be the best um, international ambassadors if you don't understand religion? And so the innovation has to be there. Um, and I'll, I'll, uh, the story of Canada recently, it, they got it wrong. They did not allow Trinity Western University to open up a law school out of a faith-based university because they said, no, we're going to homogenize things. And they actually, the Supreme Court of Connecticut, uh, Canada said, no, you may not open your law school unless you change some of your religious principles. That's a mistake. It thinned out the Canadian civil society. And the United States has to be really on guard about that. Not, it, it, we've got to be more engaged with each other and more equipped to do what I'm going to call civility in its best form. And you talk a lot about civility. Mm -hmm. So Ibu, the last comment is yours before we move to Q&A. Sure. So, so uh, I want to I return to, to uh, the heart of the original question, which is the, the power of a national narrative. Yeah. and how, what comes after Judeo-Christian, right? And the thing, I, I want to emphasize a couple of things here. Number one, uh, I want to return to the fact that Judeo-Christian is an invented term which did great work for about 60 years, right? I would much rather be a, be a Jew in uh, 1955 
under the national narrative Judeo-Christian than in 1925 under the under we're a Protestant nation and as that great liberal lion Franklin Delano Roosevelt says we're a Protestant nation the Jews and Catholics are here under sufferance right so just think about how much of an improvement the term Judeo-Christian is that new narrative and now with significant communities of Muslims of Buddhists, of Jains, of Sikhs, of Hindus, of uh, atheists, agnostics, and seekers, the term Judeo-Christian has run its course. We should honor its place and we should ask the question, what's the, what's the next step, right? Absolutely. So the, the way I think to, to myself is we're an interfaith nation. We're a nation with, that has particular respect for religious identity, that has as part of its founding ideal, the welcoming of religious diversity, whose civil society is based in no small part on nurturing interfaith cooperation. We are much more a potluck than a melting pot. Mm -hmm. A melting pot says, don't bring your identity. Mm -hmm. A potluck says, bring the, the dish from your identity. Bring your contribution. There are general guidelines here. Don't bring anything that's gonna poison people. Right? Uh, uh, try to bring things that, that uh, are generally going to fit together on this table. But if everybody brings hummus, the potluck doesn't go well. Right? The potluck is a lot more interesting when we welcome the contributions of a variety of communities. Equally. Equally. And the more, in some ways, the better. Now, that doesn't mean arrangements don't have to happen and there aren't some guidelines. But what happens in a potluck, right? You taste surprising food. Fusions emerge. Palates expand. That's that's I'm how I'm gonna describe a potluck the, like this the next time I met one. Yeah, <laughs> that's a beautiful food analogies beautiful. never get old when you're talking about interfaith. Um, I stay gonna, up at night thinking of new analogies. So <laughs> we're gonna move into uh, Q and A, and Marnie and Allison have handheld mics. We're gonna do a little switch, and I want to say two things before that. One is that uh, because of the very generous donation of the El Hebrew Foundation, these books don't need to be purchased today. They're being given away, so they'll be on the table outside as you're leaving. Our report, which came out earlier this year called Pluralism and Peril, is also going to be available um, outside, also for free. Uh, if you want Ibu to sign your book, he's happy to do it. He's not going to sit and sign, but he's happy to do it. He wants to have conversations with people. Um, Meryl, I'd ask you to come up here, and I'm going to go behind the podium so you can be part of our Q&A. Oh, and my foot has fallen asleep. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm okay. holding my mic. OK. Um, <clears throat> Okay. Yes, the woman in the blue dress, Marnie. Thank you. Uh, this is principally for Earl, but anybody can answer. Um, can you, sorry, can you introduce yourself oh, and your affiliation? Oh, sorry. Um, my name is Aubrey. I'm with the Episcopal Church Office of Government Relations. Um, so what would you say to educational institutions that are dealing with this pushback from students to find, in a variety of ways, not just um, inclusion, but equity? You, you start with a little humility, as usually I would say. As a former <laughs> dean and provost, uh, and let alone a faculty member, I'm reminded that um, students at 18 or 19 should want to have, create a better world. And in fact, we as a society are worse off if our young people never want to improve things. Mm. And so if you start with that as a sort of operational assumption or a first principle, and then you ask the questions, what are they asking? It's not that you actually always agree. You sometimes challenge, and I certainly have a history uh, in many rows of challenging students who would come into my office and uh, demanding and I do A, B, C, or D. But I also listened to them because I wanted them to believe they could be the architects of the future we all hope to imagine. And if you start with that as the second principle, they are the architects of the future we hope to imagine. Then you began to put together then the building pieces here uh, for your institution. And if leaders can actually start there with a first and second and maybe go to a third principle, which is a living and dynamic institution is one that's always changing. And it's one that's actually trying to deal with the tension between continuity and change. And so if you can actually figure out a way how you deal with that tension between continuity and change, imagine uh, that there's a future that can be created. Uh, and that students uh, really uh, should be the, that architect and uh, conclude with the sense then that uh, you want these students to demand more of you. Mm -hmm. Then you begin to put in place some of the things that actually may uh, lead uh, to uh, an institution uh, that has uh, not only diversity and inclusion, uh, but is viewed as equitable. Cordell. 
Thank you. Cordell Carter with the Socrates program here at the Aspen Institute. I want to return to Ibu's uh, analogy about the potluck. Uh, I, I have an 11-year-old, so I'm reliving my previous 42 years through the eyes of a, a little person. And we have a lot of uncomfortable conversations about religion. And I wonder, um, as, as we are inviting people to potluck, um, are we allowing them to bring in dishes that are only for men? Are we allowing them to bring in dishes that are only for people of a certain skin tone? Uh, what are the guardrails um, and preconditions mm -hmm. for this grand potluck? Can I add to that? Because there's a question online that's similar, which is that how do you not derail the conversation with all of the nasty stuff that's in every religion um, or re between religious communities? Nice to see you, friend. Thank you for coming. Uh, I have an 11-year-old, and I'm 42 also. <laughs> are, you getting the same, are, you, are you getting the same questions I am? The ones you're like, don't ask your dad that question, actually. <laughs> um, uh, so I think that this is being constantly renegotiated all the time. And I think that one of the things about the United States is that we can do that, right? There is a, a, a part of what's in American DNA is that the nation is a constant conversation, right? Political philosophers talk about uh, uh, a diverse democracy as, as a place that's a constant conversation, that's asking the question, how do you respect the distinctiveness of a particular identity community, say the Amish, uh, and the right of 13-year-old girls to go to school? What's the, what's the balance between that? Uh, if, if you, if the Amish, let's say, uh, say that it is a part of their religious tradition to take their kids out of public school at 13, uh, does the state coercively force them to do that, therefore, in their eyes, making them be less Amish? Or does it say, actually, we are going to uh, affirm the, the distinctive individual human right of this 13-year-old girl, and she's gonna, we're going to force her to go to school? Right? So I think that there's, there's lots of questions around this. Right? There's lots of Supreme Court questions around this. Uh, Hobby Lobby is a great example of that. I think part of what should be a part of the discussion is that religious identity is treated distinctively in American constitutional law. So for example, if you're a prisoner in Arkansas and you want to grow your beard four inches and prison law or prison regulations forbid that, you cannot say, I am from Georgia, I'm going to take the prison to the Supreme Court and say, as a Georgian, I demand my right to grow my beard four inches. You can't say, I'm 42 years old. You can't register your age identity. You can't say, I'm, I'm Chinese, but you can say, I'm Muslim. And as a Muslim, in American constitutional law, there's, partic there's particular, uh, particular sensitivity, preference, privilege for religious identities. And there is a, a, a wider berth for those identities. How wide is that berth? I'm not sure. Right? I think that's constantly being renegotiated. I don't think religious identity is more important than other identities, race, gender, sexuality, geography, class, but I don't think it's less important either. So we are renegotiating this right now, and I just think we should celebrate that. There's all kinds of, of challenges and problems, but wouldn't you rather be a nation that can have conversations, every demographic shift, every, uh, um, every economic shift, and say, who are we now, rather than one that says, actually, we were formed 1500, you know, 500 years ago, and this is who we're going to be forever. I'd rather be renegotiating all the time. Meryl, Meryl do you have anything? Yeah, well, uh, th there's the, the tolerance intolerance divide is one of the most difficult problems we're facing. Mm -hmm. And intolerance is on the rise in this country. And uh, the rule of law model is, should not be sympathetic to intolerance, yet we have to find a way to make peace with people of strong religious values. Now, the problem that, that I'm seeing right now is um, the, the vigor of the intolerance narrative and how it seems to be propagated through online forums and through uh, proponents who, who have a megaphone right now. And the question that I think is a challenge and unites people of goodwill 
uh, who are from tolerant versions of whatever faith, is how do we all work together to construct the robust narrative, make the case for toleration and for pluralism in the way that the case now seems to be being made for intolerance? And, and that's, that's a question for all of us in the room, I think. Yes, lots of hands up here in the front row, blue dress. Thank you, Sabrina Dent from the Religious Freedom Center. Nice How to see you, Sabrina. Good to see you too. Um, so you mentioned, Ibu, that there's great power to have in this national narrative. Um, but at the same time, Dr. Lewis raised awareness on like whose America you know, can be claimed in terms of the narrative. So I'm wondering if there should be a shift in language to say national narratives because there are some things that are not accepted. So when I think about in the work that we do in terms of religious liberty, um, that we advocate for religious liberty, but there is that narrative where you think of the enslaved who were not able to practice religious yeah. freedom. Um, also the work that we do about civil dialogue is to really have those conversations and seek understanding. So where are the spaces in which this is happening outside of colleges and universities? And how are colleges and universities really addressing this issue? Because there are some people that are not ready to accept the real narrative. Oh, and then we can go that way. OK. I was about to bounce it early and then come the other way. Um, <laughs> I think there have always been narratives, plural rather than singular, and in fact, I would argue there have been conflicting narratives uh, about who's America. I mean, in some ways, my story of the two flags uh, is a symbolic illustration of these conflicting narratives about who's America and how do we claim them. I think the challenges and in, in where the institutions, there are a host of institutions. There are philanthropic institutions that are underwriting a set of activities all across the United States that aren't always visible unless you read the byline about who uh, they're supporting. And there are um, museums. I mean, in this uh, city, maybe you can just walk uh, down the, the mall, and the Smithsonian actually offers a, a, a range of competing narratives about the national past. Uh, and if you start just below uh, the Washington Monument, go to uh, the new National History, uh, African American History and Culture Museum, and make your all way all the way uh, to the American Indian Museum, you have a series of narratives uh, about America. Uh, and the ways in which one challenges the other. You stop at the American History Museum and you go across the street, you have slightly different versions of the same story. Uh, and how then that visitor and guest to put it together. I think the challenge for us is because there's a multiplicity of narratives, which ones then become the most salient? Uh, and who and in what ways then we elevate some above the fray and, 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 and can be heard and seen and understood? But that's always been a challenge uh, in American life. It's perhaps more intensely so now because of all of the ways in which we receive information uh, and the ways in which we can also ignore information uh, that we don't want uh, to receive. And I said, I mean, in, in, in my view, perhaps one of the greatest challenges uh, to the creation of this um, uh, throughput through all of these narratives is the decline uh, of small uh, city newspapers and small town yeah. newspapers because they, in a different point in American history, uh, were the ones that pulled out these narratives and then anchored them in a local community in a way that people could see themselves on a national scale. Uh, and so what's going to replace them? What institutions and organizations are there to replace them? And this is the work that I know is underway, but I think this is something that needs to be considered over and over and over again. I'll stop there. Any of the others have a comment? Can I that? just put in a small plug for something called The Patch, which is a whole network of very hyper-local newspapers mm. and, and online presence that report local. These are, these are a wonderful asset in American okay. communities. I also just want to add something to what you said about the museums. Um, so small gestures can mean an enormous amount. Um, I was recently at the New Museum of the American Revolution mm. uh, in, in Philadelphia, and there is one small thing. It's a, uh, a, a locket in Arabic mm -hmm. that was recovered from one of the original sites in, you know, it, it very, very early. And just that one moment for somebody who's paying attention just opens an aperture on a whole other, what we've been talking about, what Ibu's been talking about, an aperture on a whole thing. So it's just one small moment in thousands in the museum that opens that aperture. Yeah. Oh, 
Very good. Yes. My name is Victor Ghalibbeg. Uh, uh, Interfaith has been an intense corner of my life, and I really appreciate your presence here. Just want to point out that the uh, landscape for Muslim Americans started after the Iranian Revolution. 9-11 is more more recent thing. I just finished writing my own socio-political interfaith memoir, Our Muslim Neighbors. Uh, I just want to uh, comment on something that uh, Ibu said about Judeo-Christian. And then I'll ask my question. Uh, I built a mosque in Bloomfield Hills. Uh, that was before 9-11. And, uh, and uh, the title of that mosque, I still have a copy of it, of, of that property, said no, no uh, non-Gentiles, no Gentiles or uh, non-Gentiles or people of color can build on that property. And a mosque stands on it today. Mm -hmm. So that, that's a huge improvement, however, after 9-11, I think things have really gone worse. Uh, immediately after 9-11, they were better, but more recently, they have. So how do you uh, think that the, this religious pluralism, which includes the Muslim, will, 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 ha will continue uh, in the light of uh, what's going on today, the Muslim ban? And how do you change a, 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 a Trump a diehard voter's mind when you have this uh, uh, hundreds of thousands, millions being spent on Islamophobia, all you need to do is to r read the report Fear, Inc. by a, a Center of American Pluralism, uh, and then the social media. So we live in a very difficult time as a Muslim, and I work every day. That's why I wrote a book called Our Muslim Neighbors, and I find our neighbors are good. However, the the the, when the president says Islam hates uh, America, how do we counter that? Thank you. I'm gonna um, I want to take maybe two more questions and then just give them uh, because we're running a little short on time. Um, who else has questions? Uh, yep, with glasses in the back. Hi, uh, Rami Shabana from the El Hebri Foundation. Um, I guess it might be a kind of a two-part question. Um, we mentioned examples of, of uh, different faiths coming together um, and disaster relief scenarios, kind of like Houston or uh, mm -hmm. even, Ibu, you mentioned the American Muslim community kind of coming together, you know, post 9-11 and kind of realizing we need to work with each other. Um, how, do we, how do we break out of, out of that shell where we're only responding to disasters? How do we prepare ourselves, kind of like the example that Shirley gave with mm -hmm. the, uh, the pastors in Dallas, mm -hmm. you know, working a, a, a year um, in advance. How do, we, how do we do that and how do we amplify that voice and how do we unify that voice more, you know, in, in the name of pluralism so that we're always prepared and that we're, you know, doing much, much more than, than just uh, responding to disasters? Thank you. And then um, you had a question. Yeah, in the black shirt, she had a question for a while. Hi, Linda Russell, retired psychologist, and um, I like your um, information about the potluck, and one of the things that I wonder about is what you're talking about, even though you're putting it within a religious framework, is more ethics and a belief system of what's just. and. I'm wondering if you could include people who are agnostic or atheist or in non-religious schools to feel that they have a place at the table as well to put their thoughts into action and service for others and to expand the philosophy. And another thing that was said, I remember when I was in one of the schools, one of my colleagues said, I have to talk to you, close the door, because they were having a new curriculum called Teaching Tolerance in the schools. And she said, I have to tell you, I don't want to be tolerated. I want to be respected. Mm -hmm. And it's the equal level. You don't want to be a guest to the table. You want to belong at the table, regardless of what stories you hold to believe. And I'm just wondering about your opinion in terms of expanding that definition to spirituality and ethics. 
Thank you. So the first question is, how do we address kind of increasing Islamophobia, particularly when it's been politicized? The second one is, how do we build these kind of national networks and frameworks proactively and not in rapid response uh, so that they are in terms, they're in terms of need? And the third question is, how do we make sure the table is welcome to everybody um, beyond just those who identify with a religious affiliation? Um, anybody is welcome to start? Um, I'll, I would like to just talk about three words. Um, one is something that's already been mentioned by Earl, uh, starting with a posture of humility. Uh, so what don't I know and what can I learn? And this idea of uh, what you've mentioned about uh, how can we bring together people who are religious and also non-religious to the conversation is a sense of humility. The other one uh, to our um, uh, eloquent um, questioner here is about identifying fear. So um, if you are unaware, sort of, uh, you're, not, um, you're not picking up on whether you are operating out of fear or principle. And um, identifying that more is very important. Uh, and because if you can identify that, you can say, look, I think we can do better than operating out of a posture of fear. Um, and then thirdly, uh, I think we have to be proactive I think we have to do intentional things about having people have the kinds of conversations. And because we were talking about higher education, how do we get professors in various different uh, universities with various points of views to start to model that and can teach it uh, for students? Great, thank you. Uh, so I'll start here. Um, I, I would like to think that uh, I'll repeat again that 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 uh, America and the human condition at large is defined more by the response to ugliness by, than by the ugliness itself. So I would like to think that the United States after the 1950s and 1960s and the civil rights movement is more defined by the civil rights movement or that, that will say more about its future than the unbelievable ugliness of, of slavery and segregation in the past. That doesn't mean that, that, that those other dimensions are forgotten about and clearly the vestiges still stay and still what defines the future is the civil rights movement more than slavery, I would like to think. Right now, we have, there's lots of work to be done. How do we build on that? And similarly, um, the step forward that was Judeo-Christian from exclusively Protestant defined the past 70 years more than, uh, more than the anti-Semitism and anti-Catholicism, right? So, so what we do now with respect to building an interfaith America, with respect to our, our civic, um, our legal, our policy, uh, our symbolic response to the religious bigotry of our time, I would like to think would define our future more. So the question is, how do we do that work well, right? Um, I actually don't think we are going to go back to a time, uh, to your question, of uh, Syrian Muslims, Indonesian Muslims, Pakistani Muslims, Saudi Muslims, Iranian Muslims, et cetera, uh, principally organizing around those ethno-national religious orientations uh, in a way that in which they are not only apart from each other, but perhaps even in tension and opposition. I think part of this is just, is just generational. So, so on most college campuses, there aren't 12 Muslim students associations, an Iranian one, an Indonesian one, a Pakistani one. There's, there's, there's just enough Muslims to kind of make up one. And the Sunnis and the Shias, and the Sufis and the Salafis, and the, even the Iranians and the Saudis got to, got, to figure out, got to work it out, right? I would like to think that that doesn't melt away all vestiges of those ethno-religious dimensions, but frankly, perhaps the ones that would, uh, uh, that would be in opposition to one another. I, I don't want, for example, the relationship between Iranian Muslims and Saudi Muslims in, in the United States to be principally dictated by the rivalry between those two nations elsewhere. I would, like, I would like their relationship to be principally dictated by what it means for them to be Iranian American, Saudi American students in college campuses here, how they continue to, to connect to, to Islam and their ethno-religious heritage, and how they work together to serve, to serve the common good. So I think that this is in part the story of, of uh, America, the potluck, so to speak, is, is um, uh, 
it's the renegotiation within these various communities that happen with Catholics, that happen with the Jews, and that, that's, not, that's not happening with Muslims. Um, uh, finally, uh, I think that the highest dignity a nation uh, offers its citizens is the opportunity to contribute, mm. right? Uh, that, that, that you bring your dish to the American potluck, right? Uh, and that's when, 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 you know, I've spent enough time in India, in Kenya, in South Africa, I studied in Britain for three and a half years, and my conclusion is that it's this patch of earth called America that I have the best chance to shape. Even though there's, there's uh, uh, prejudice against my skin color, even though some people look at my name and they're like, is that really American? Even though uh, uh, you know, my religious community has to fight to establish its houses of worship, this nation gives me the best chance to contribute. Right? And so I think that that's remarkable. And, and, and I think that, that every generation of Americans gets to ask the question, how do we write the next chapter of the American project? And that's part of what we're doing here. Thank you, Abu. Um, Merle and Merrill, just like quick closing, because we're, we're out of time. OK, we're out of time. And I will just say this, is that I agree with what, what Shirley and Ibu had to say, and will say that I think the challenge for us, as well as the opportunity, is to look ahead, uh, and to look ahead 2030 and 2040. Because some of the issues that have surfaced over the last 20, 25 years, there's another word I would introduce, it's insecurity. There's a level of insecurity at the individual level, at the institutional level, and at the social level. And if you believe the McKinsey report, uh, any aspects of it, which projects that 800 million jobs will disappear by 2030, jobs that are currently exist, 54 million in the United States, one third of the American labor force uh, by 2030. Uh, the level of insecurity is scheduled to a height, increase significantly in a very short period of time. And when people are insecure, they react uh, in intolerant ways. They don't necessarily believe uh, you should be at their table because they believe they're scarce resources uh, and that they want to husband and hold those resources closely. Uh, they uh, are always in crisis mode because uh, everything looks like a crisis. And so our ability to actually create a world that we actually uh, can um, shape uh, um, requires us to look ahead a decade or two and to put in place now those elements that make sure that we have a secure world rather than the insecure world. Thank you all. And I, I just want to close uh, with saying that one of the things that's so important in this work is that everybody has to show up for each other. I mean, we have to show up at each other's events. We have to understand that we're all community. Uh, and so I want to thank everybody here for showing <laughs> up uh, and, and urge you to continue to go out and, and do more. Thank you for being here. Please grab a book. There's a book table outside. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Thank you. That's great. That's a great closing.